Thank you and welcome. What a wonderful turnout. A uh, couple of housekeeping events, before, uh, information before I introduce the secretary. Uh, we will have question and answer after his uh, speech. There's a microphone down at the end of, in the middle of this row, and there's a microphone right over there. You can't really see it in the, but it's sort of in between these posts here. So uh, if you could, if you have a question, please line up behind one or the other microphone and I will uh, facilitate the discussion. The secretary has to be out of here at 610, so um, I'm gonna, I may cut you off if, um, if uh, we start to run over time. But we are absolutely delighted to have Secretary of Agriculture Tom Vilsack with us today and to have him present this lecture to the World Affairs Program. He is certainly no stranger to this state, this campus, or to the people of Iowa. He has served as governor of Iowa from 1998 to 2006, and during that time he was on our campus many times for events like the Bioindustry Conference, the Biofuel Seminars, Economic Development Meetings, and many, many other events. And as Secretary of Agriculture, he has been here often as well, bringing international dignitaries to Iowa and to campus and holding a global farmer town hall here just last October. Secretary Vilsack has always had his eye on the broader vision of agriculture and the multiple important roles that it plays, feeding the world, supplying the world with resources it needs and in renewable energy and renewable chemicals and supporting the rural lifestyle. And most importantly, doing these ways that are sustainable and non-competing. As governor, he was instrumental in creating the foundation that we are building on today to make Iowa a world center in the bioeconomy. He created the Iowa Grow, Out Value, Grow Iowa Values Fund. He served in national leadership positions among governors in promoting the development of cellulosic ethanol and other renewable fuels. And he formally adopted the bio-based products and bioenergy vision and roadmap for Iowa that was created at his urging by Iowans, including many here in this audience at Iowa State. And for the past three years as Secretary of Agriculture, he has continued these efforts on a national scale with a primary focus on strengthening rural America. Iowa State has had a long and outstanding working relationship with the Department of Agriculture, and that continues today with Secretary Vilsack. In recent months, Iowa State received two major grant awards from the USDA's National Institute of Food and Agriculture, NEFA, for our work in two key areas of agriculture, biofuels production and sustainability. The climate change mitigation and adaptation in corn-based cropping system study, led by Professor Lo Lois Wright Morton, and the agri ecosystem approach to sustainable biofuels production via the pyrolysis biochair platform study led by distinguished professor Ken Moore. We are very excited about these projects and the positive impact they will have on agriculture in Iowa and the nation and the world and we appreciate USDA's and Secretary Vilsack's strong support of these efforts. The secretary also continues a long and distinguished line of Iowans who has served as Secretary of Agriculture, many of whom graduated from or were from former faculty members at Iowa State. In the late 19th and early 20th century, they included James Wilson, Henry Wallace, and Henry A. Wallace, who also served as U.S. Vice President under Franklin Roosevelt. I was honored to have Tom Vilsack continue that great tradition of national leadership in agriculture. Please join me in welcoming Secretary of Agriculture, Tom Vilsack. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hoffman, for that very kind uh, introduction. Um, and it's uh, great to know that we actually gave uh, two grants to Iowa State. Uh, who knew? Uh, <laughs> Although I will say that uh, on the biofuel announcement, I thought it was interesting, all of the hubbub about uh, Big 12 football realignment. It was interesting to see Iowa State affiliated with five Big 10 universities in that grant application. 
That's the kind of cooperation and coordination I think we ought to see more of uh, <laughs> in a number of areas. Um, fellas, thanks very much for this opportunity. As you, as you uh, stood here, uh, I couldn't help but think of a time when I, uh, at Hamilton College, had a similar uh, responsibility uh, for a forum program that we had at Hamilton, although it was much smaller uh, than the one you fellows are, are engaged in. So I appreciate uh, uh, your leadership in bringing to Iowa State and bringing to this campus and bringing to the state of Iowa uh, a lot of important people uh, that hopefully will trigger uh, a lot of conversation and, uh, and thought here on campus. Uh, and I want to thank all of you for taking time from busy schedules to be here. Uh, Christy and I are, are pleased to be here this afternoon. And I hope that, uh, uh, that we have a good conversation. I'm going to take uh, around 20, 25 minutes, uh, perhaps uh, maybe not as much as that, to briefly go around the world and talk a little bit about food uh, security and insecurity. Uh, but to do that, I have to first and foremost sort of frame the challenge that we have. Uh, there are 925 million people on the world and the globe today that are undernourished, 925 million. Now, the good news is that despite the economic difficulties that we've seen recently around the world, that number has not increased uh, over the last couple of years. In fact, it, at one point in time, that number topped a billion. So we have seen some progress, uh, albeit small, uh, in reducing the number of food insecure people in the world today, but there's still 925 million. Now, when you consider the challenge that we face over the next 30 to 40 years, with the world population increasing and the need for food having to increase by 70 percent in order to feed that ever-increasing world population, you can see that we're faced with a, a serious long-term challenge. When you add to that the consequences uh, and, and difficulties that may uh, confront us with climate change uh, and the rather severe weather patterns we're beginning to see uh, and how that might impact crop production, uh, both current crop production and future crop production, you see the challenge is even more daunting. And when you add to that uh, the fact that we're going to continue to be challenged to meet the energy needs uh, of a growing world population and a population that is beginning to see uh, emerging economies, uh, it is ser seriously a very real, real challenge. Uh, but we have a lot in this country going for us uh, as we try to deal with this challenge. First and foremost, we have a remarkable asset in our land resources. Uh, you know, I've, I travel around the country giving lots of speeches, and one of the things I try to remind Americans of is the fact that because we have this wonderful landmass, uh, we also have a sense of food security here in this country that other countries do not enjoy. Uh, our farmers, who are the most productive in the world, are capable of producing enough to feed the United States population. That's not true in many, many of the world's countries today. Uh, so we have this enormous land opportunity and advantage combined with the most productive farmers in the world. When you look at the private sector investment in research and development and technology, uh, the rather sophisticated equipment uh, that we currently have uh, being used in agriculture today, and you look at what's being done on the university campuses, uh, specifically and primarily in the land-grant university system, uh, you see that despite the fact that this challenge is real uh, and success not guaranteed, uh, we do have an opportunity here in America, and I think we actually have a responsibility uh, to meet this challenge. Now, at USDA, we're very focused on this. Uh, part of the Department of Agriculture's responsibility is to address this issue. And we have three guiding principles that I briefly want to review with you today in terms of how we approach uh, this issue of food insecurity around the world. First of all, we are a big, big believer in innovation. Uh, it is our view uh, at USDA that innovation through research and development will help us develop the technologies from seed technology to uh, harvesting processes to implements, et cetera, uh, that will give us the capacity uh, to be able to produce more food even though the amount of land available to produce that food will not likely grow. In fact, it may be diminished by expanding communities, cities, and towns. Innovation key. Equally important is the notion of extension. I can't tell you how many times I have traveled outside this country as U.S. Secretary of Agriculture and spoken to individuals in Africa and Asia uh, and around the world. And the one thing that they are most envious of in this country is our extension system, our ability to get information from our universities, from our labs, from our research areas, 
into the field in practical ways that makes a fundamental difference in operations. Uh, so our capacity to make sure that we continue to invest in innovation and extension I think are critical. Uh, we face some budget challenges in this country and one hope I have is as we face these budget challenges, we do not minimize, uh, we do not reduce our, our commitment to, to research. Uh, there is fairly good data and fairly good research on research that suggests that when you reduce your commitment to research in the agricultural arena, you also reduce your capacity to be productive. America's productivity gains, and we've seen rather remarkable gains in my lifetime, 300% corn uh, productivity gain, 200% plus in, in soybeans and, and wheat. Those gains are a direct result of the investments that have been made in research. Uh, if we shortchange research in, in the short term, the long-term consequence of that will be that America will be less prepared to help ourselves and the world meet this challenge. So that's the reason why uh, we decided to come together, uh, USDA, with 30 other countries uh, and their agricultural agencies and departments to form the Global Research Alliance. We were deeply concerned uh, uh, about the changing weather patterns that we're seeing. And to give you a sense of this, and we can get into a debate about what causes all of this, but this is the reality today. Uh, we are seeing record droughts in parts of our country. We are seeing record snowfall and flooding conditions in parts of our country. Uh, and the most serious week we have ever had in terms of tornadoes and severe storms uh, was averaging about 150 tornadoes a week. In May of this year, we had 350 tornadoes in one week. And we had hurricanes that extended to the point where I was in upstate New York looking at hurricane damage. Uh, climate change is real, uh, and we have to know uh, that it will have an impact on our capacity to produce crops, where and how much uh, crops we'll be able to produce. So we have band together with 30 different countries in this Global Research Alliance to make sure that we do a better job of coordinating our research. Because we all understand, from New Zealand to the United States and uh, European countries, Asian countries, uh, are all banding together uh, to look at what we're researching, to allocate responsibilities based on core competencies, and sharing the results of that research globally. So our hope is that the Global Research Alliance will, will allow us to continue to innovate. Uh, and that, together with uh, some programs I'm going to talk about in just a minute, will allow us to continue to extend, if you will, that information into countries around the world. The second, uh, the second principle uh, is that increased productivity need not come at the sacrifice of uh, sustainable natural resources. Uh, in fact, it's very important for us uh, to make sure that we continue to focus on strategies that allow us to do more with less. One of the principal concerns we have from a natural resource perspective, in addition to soil erosion, which is always present, is the, the challenges that we have in this country and challenges that we see across uh, the globe in terms of water. Uh, water is going to be one of the emerging issues, if it's not already a significant issue, uh, in international discussions uh, and in agriculture. Uh, and it will be important and necessary for us to commit to finding ways to use water more efficiently. Uh, we are, uh, at USDA, we are heavily engaged in promoting agricultural transformation in the, in the country of Afghanistan. Uh, we believe that there are reasons why folks ought to be growing pomegranates and apricots instead of poppy. Uh, one of the things we're trying to do is to redevelop an irrigation system that worked very well for them uh, prior to, um, uh, to, to wars and conflict that they had uh, some 30 years ago. Their irrigation systems were used to uh, store uh, weapons and were destroyed during those conflicts, and so those irrigation systems need to be rebuilt. In the meantime, we're trying to figure out ways in which we can, can teach and show uh, more creative ways to use water resources uh, to be able to maximize those resources. And we're also focused on uh, reforestation uh, of, of, the, uh, of the country of Afghanistan. They have the capacity to have rather significant timber, uh, but it was used again during the conflict. Uh, and as a result, they don't have the natural reservoir or, or, or conservation uh, uh, efforts that forests uh, generally provide. Uh, so it's important and necessary on a country by country level to look at the individual challenge that each country has as it relates to natural resources and food production and be able to tailor and structure an approach 
to the individual country's needs. And that takes me to the third principle, which is that regardless of what the United States knows, regardless of what the United States has, it is important and vital that whatever aid and assistance we provide is dictated and determined by the countries we're helping. Uh, this cannot be a circumstance where we're imposing our will or our thoughts on countries. Uh, this is got to be a situation in which countries come to the United States and they say essentially we have a problem with X, can you help us? So for example, uh, many countries are very concerned about uh, wheat stem rust and so the United States is trying to respond uh, with assistance uh, through the Kenyan Agricultural Research Institute uh, to try to determine if there are ways in which we can accelerate the research on wheat to be able to determine how we might be able to uh, uh, eliminate uh, that threat, uh, which could be a significant threat to wheat crops around the world. Uh, we're also teaming up with the University of Minnesota uh, and USDA for a research project here at home uh, to expand on the work that's being done in Kenya. So it is a country-led effort. Uh, to do that, we established, when I, when I came into office and when Secretary Clinton came into her position as the Secretary of State, we decided to begin shifting our, our, our efforts away from a significant reliance on just food assistance, that is to say providing our surplus to the rest of the world uh, that was hungry, and begin to figure out strategies in which we could empower those in countries that were struggling with food security to be able to produce their own food. Uh, we call it Feed the Future. Uh, and it's a cooperative effort between the State Department, USAID, and USDA. It's focused on three uh, basic principles, and that is that we have to make food available, we have to make it accessible, and it has to be properly utilized. On the availability side, we're focused on seed technology, on making sure that the right seed technology, the right fertilizer, the right planting process is being used. Uh, I'll give you an example in Haiti. Uh, we began to do soil surveys and we realized that the fertilizer that was being used by Haitian farmers was really not what it needed to be in order to maximize their productivity. So with a little bit of help, a little bit of different direction, uh, we now are seeing uh, more productivity coming out of, uh, out of Haiti. Accessible has to do with the fact that you can grow the food, but can you properly store it, can you transport it, and will there be a market for it? These are all very complicated things in developing countries. Uh, we see a substantial amount of food loss just simply because there are not adequate storage uh, operations and facilities uh, in uh, either on the farm or in terms of regional storage. We take our storage system here in the United States totally for granted. Uh, the reality is that's very hard to replicate in other countries. And so we see uh, post-harvest loss as much as 40, 50, sometimes 60 percent of a crop. So we can grow the food. But if we don't preserve it and store it properly, it won't be uh, uh, as much good as it needs to be. If there's no market, uh, if there's no capacity to get the food to a place where it will actually be sold and transported, that too creates problems. And so as we work on Feed the Future, we look at ways in which we can help create markets, help create standards, help create uh, phytosanitary and sanitary standards that ensure marketability and also help to get those countries to a point where if they are able to produce, they're also able to export. And if they're able to export, they're able to generate opportunities and wealth in their country. Emerging middle classes uh, create new opportunities uh, and create less poverty uh, and less threat uh, in terms of hunger. Properly used means very simply that it's, that it's refrigerated or cooked in a way that provides uh, a safe and nutritious supply of food. You have to have all three. You have to have food that's available, it's got to be accessible to the people who need it, and it's got to be properly utilized. So the Feed the Future initiative is designed to, to address all three of those issues. And each agency and department has its core competencies that it lends to this effort. So for example, at USDA, we focus on three principal competencies. One is this whole information and, and analysis re, that is required to, to create a market. Uh, we have an enormous amount of data here in the United States that we pour over that helps to inform the market. Well, we're providing that same kind of opportunity in, in emerging uh, uh, agricultural countries uh, so that they have adequate statistical information to know what they're growing and how much they have of it and how much is in storage. And, and, and that helps to create a more stable and secure market process. We also focus on in-country in -country capacity. We have two fellowships. 
Uh, there's a, a Borlaug Fellowship named after Norman Borlaug. There's a Cochrane Fellowship named after Senator Cochrane. And those two fellowships basically provide our capacity to have exchanges between our scientists and our experts uh, with folks in, in, in countries around the world. Uh, those, those fellowships can be anywhere from a couple of weeks, in some cases to six months. But it really provides an opportunity for information sharing. Uh, and the hope is that as we train and educate folks in country, they in turn will be able to create uh, some kind of extension process that allows them to take that information and knowledge uh, and, and expand it around the country. It has to do with uh, sanitary and phytosanitary standards. Those are extremely important. If you don't have them, if you don't understand them, you're never going to be able to export. You're never going to be able to guarantee and satisfy uh, markets. Uh, it also has to do with the whole issue of trade and how uh, countries will be able to trade what they can produce the most of and the best of with that which they need to be able to supply the needs of their, uh, of their people. USDA is heavily engaged in that. And finally, we're, we're, we're as I said before, uh, our third competency obviously is research. Uh, through our own in-house research, uh, with our Agricultural Research Service at ARS, and our uh, external efforts with the uh, land-grant universities in particular, we have enormous capacity uh, to focus on specific research issues that will be meaningful to, uh, to countries uh, around the world. Now, we do this uh, in a very focused way. We don't have the resources to help every country, so we are focusing on uh, roughly uh, 20 countries or so that have the greatest possibility of moving the dial most quickly. And then as they emerge, uh, we'll focus our attention uh, on other countries as well. Now, in addition to the Feed the Future initiative, we do have and will continue to have a commitment to food assistance programs. Uh, we have the Food for Progress program and we have the McGovern Dole program. The McGovern Dole program in particular has tremendous power because you combine the ability to feed children with an educational opportunity for those children. McGovern Dole basically works somewhat similar to our school lunch and school breakfast program in that it provides nutrition in a school site. I had an enormous uh, personal opportunity to see the power of this idea when I traveled to Kenya uh, several years ago. I started out life in an orphanage, and so uh, the, the staff thought it would be uh, perhaps meaningful to me to go to an orphanage, which was also a school in Kenya, and have an opportunity to talk to young people uh, who were orphaned, uh, most often as a result of, uh, of HIV and AIDS, and, and talk to them about their experience. Uh, I happened to get there just about the time for lunch. Uh, lunch uh, was not just lunch, it was actually breakfast, lunch, and dinner uh, for these children. They only had one meal a day. Uh, it was served in a, in a red cup uh, that is uh, provided by the, uh, the World Food Organizations. Uh, as, a, as, a, as a way of helping these young people. And in that cup was uh, a mixture of sorghum and, and other, uh, other items that was sort of looked like oatmeal. Uh, and they grabbed it, were happy to receive it. So I had an opportunity as I was basically uh, providing this food for these, uh, for these children to ask them what they liked most about school. Now, if I asked that question to the students who are here, I'm sure I would, have get, I, I'm sure I would get a number of different answers especially if I ask you when you were in high school. Uh, you know, there were probably some very interesting answers you could give me, what you liked about school. Every single one of these students, every single one of them, answered the reason they liked school was because that's where they got fed. It's a powerful, powerful program. It helps right now roughly four to five million children. Uh, and it's an opportunity for us uh, here in the United States to share our bounty, but to do it in a way that, that really makes a difference in people's lives. Now, we aren't doing this in isolation. The United States is not doing it. USDA uh, is not doing it in isolation. We also are engaged in working on an international uh, uh, platform uh, to work with other countries that have similar goals to ours. Uh, and uh, earlier this year, I had a chance to, to uh, travel to Paris uh, to meet for the first time uh, the agricultural secretaries and, and uh, um, directors of the G20 countries met for the first time in Paris. And the purpose of that meeting was to discuss food security so that when the G20 leaders, the presidents and the prime ministers and others met, that they would put this on their agenda and that they would hopefully make statements about this uh, in November. It was an interesting meeting. 
many countries come to these meetings with a different set of priorities. Uh, one of the issues that was discussed most uh, frequently and most often at that day and a half meeting was the notion of reserves, the capacity of the world to actually have physical reserves of food that could be drawn upon uh, in the event of, of uh, emergency circumstances. We took the position in the United States that rather than having a physical reserve uh, that could potentially lead to spoilage and some loss, it would be a better opportunity for us if we had a virtual reserve. In other words, if we had sufficient transparency among the G20 countries as to what their stocks were uh, and where they were, that we could essentially meet an emergency need uh, w almost as quickly than if we had a physical reserve. And we wouldn't have to worry about storage issues and who controlled the storage and who was responsible for transporting, et cetera. Uh, so that was a very important issue that we discussed at length, uh, and we finally got consensus that perhaps a, a virtual process would be a better process. But in order to have that process, it requires transparency. It requires countries to feel confident about being able to tell the world what they have or what they don't have. And for many countries, that is a difficult acknowledgement and admission. So we have to get over that. Uh, there are some countries who frankly believe uh, that it's better to hold on to that information. Uh, and in fact, there are some countries who believe that it's appropriate uh, in some circumstances to impose export bans because of their concern about their own capacity. And that, of course, distorts the market and makes it even more difficult and oftentimes more expensive for countries that are trying to purchase the food necessary to feed their people. So transparency becomes a critical component of an international effort to try to deal with food security. Because if you are honestly saying what you have, then the market can make a better determination as to its value. And oftentimes, you don't see speculation and you don't see run-up of prices. We think that some of the increase in food prices we've, saw, we, we've seen recently are a result of export bans last year that were imposed. Uh, and we made a strong case uh, that it's important and necessary for countries to limit the utilization of those kinds of tools. So uh, it's complicated. It's a massive challenge. We in this country have an enormous responsibility because of our capacity to produce food. We are working in a very focused way making sure that we do what we need to do to continue the increase in productivity, to make sure that we don't do it at the sacrifice of the natural resources that help us produce the food, and we do it in a way that does not appear to the outside world as the United States imposing their will as opposed to providing help and assistance. And moving in a slightly different direction than simply food assistance, really helping and empowering people in their own countries to grow and raise what they are in the best position to grow and raise, and to do it by a sharing of information, an extension of our knowledge and information, and doing it in a collaborative way uh, internationally. So that's basically the approach that we're taking at USDA, and I think the fact that we've seen stabilization in these numbers is an indication that perhaps we're on the right track, but we have quite a bit of work to do. It's extraordinarily important, and I'll end with this. As difficult and as challenging as the world is today, as concerned as folks are about uh, extremist activity, the reality is that if we are unable uh, to meet this challenge of global food security, if we are unable to produce the food as the world population grows and as emerging middle classes require more of this or that, and if we do it at a way in which we sacrifice our capacity to have natural resources in, specifically water, used in a most efficient way, uh, we will have greater conflict. Of that, I am absolutely certain. Uh, and it will be very, very difficult uh, for us to feel secure and safe in that type of world. So this is not just a moral issue. It's not just an economic issue. It's not just an agricultural issue. I think it's an issue of national security as well. So with that, I'll be happy to try to answer questions. You stood up first, so go ahead. 
Uh, yes. Uh, I had the privilege of being able to teach school in the Ukraine in 2003, and I was kind of surprised because I thought I was back in Iowa. And the lay of the land is so much like here, but what really surprised me was I got to see how the farmers used to farm and how they stored stuff probably 50 years ago, and I was surprised by the number of John Deere farm implements going all over that country. I thought there were more there than in Iowa, and big, huge silos being built. And I was wondering, is the Ukraine one of those countries that has been involved with the U.S. Department of Agriculture in your... Uh, it is, but not as much as, as countries in the sub-Saharan area of Africa, and not as much as some of the countries in, in, in Latin America that are struggling, and not as uh, much as countries in Asia, Bangladesh, and, and other countries like Bangladesh that are, that are challenged. Um, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, um, if you happen to be in the Ukraine, you happen to be in that, capa in that area where you can produce uh, 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 some, wonderful, some wonderful crops. Uh, it's a little different than it is in some of those other areas where you really are challenged to try to figure out how do you produce, um, you know, drought-resistant crops, uh, or how do you produce crops that are subjected to flooding on a fairly frequent basis. There's actually research in both of those areas going on today, uh, but it's uh, but it's a lot different than in the, uh, the, the in those areas than it is in the Ukraine. Talk to me a little bit about what you what you mean by I think I know what you mean by um, consumer level waste. Okay, that's what I thought you meant. Retail level waste, I would say. You know that is a big issue, um, and uh, I don't know that we necessarily have a particularly good answer for that. I, I think we have started down the road to a good answer, um, and it has to do with nutrition. It has to do with uh, uh, with with putting the emphasis on the obesity epidemic in this country where a third of our children are at risk of being obese or, in fact, obese. Uh, a substantial percentage of our adult population is there already, and the extraordinary health care costs associated with that, and the fact that we have got to get serious about nutrition, we have got to get serious about physical activity. So we've started down that road, which is to say that we've started looking at portion sizes and what needs to be on the plate. Now, at USDA, we have focused recently on what has to be on the plate. Uh, with our my plate uh, effort to sort of uh, eliminate that very complicated food pyramid, which I never understood, and give me something really simple that says half my plate's fruits and vegetables, I get that. The other half is grains and protein, I get that, and, and, the, and the dairy is, is on the side, I get that. So it's really simple. Now we have to make sure that the plate's not humongous. <laughs> um, and I think, I, frankly, I think restaurants are beginning to get there. Uh, I, I'm seeing them adjust portion sizes significantly. They're, they're, you're beginning to see uh, innovative ways in, re in restaurants where you're able to purchase portion sizes based on, on your appetite and, and your, your desire. So I think there is an effort uh, underway, but I, we're a long way away from, from that. And then finally, the last thing I would say is, you know, there's a lot of waste, unfortunately, in the school lunch program that we happen to be responsible for. And I think part of our challenge is to make it better, much better, so kids don't feel the necessity of putting it in the garbage can or, or buying something on a vending machine. We are making an effort with the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act of 2010 to provide more nutritious meals. We're making an effort with our Chefs Move to School program where we're encouraging chefs to come up with great recipes based on the, on the $2.50 or $0.60 a, a, a meal uh, price. Uh, and it's amazing. We just had a, a recipe contest, and we got a, a amazing hundreds of recipes uh, that from from world re renowned chefs. Uh, so I think we're going to see an improvement in the meals, which hopefully will reduce in waste. Thank you, Secretary Vilsack. I'm Tom Buman. I'm president of Agrin, a small company in Carroll, Iowa. Um, I share your enthusiasm for us to continue to support um, feeding the world, but I'm afraid what it means to our natural resources and the increased pressure. And maybe a comment as much as anything is uh, I do support, un under your administration as governor, you purchased LIDAR for the state of Iowa, and I support that throughout the United States. I think it's one of the technological advances that we can do to really protect our natural resources. And in Iowa, 
we've written some software. Uh, the state of Iowa has funded to uh, calculate soil loss under an amazing new process that we can pinpoint now um, practices to protect our natural resources. And more of a comment than anything, I hope that we continue to support LIDAR across the United States. I was one of probably five states in the nation that has complete coverage, but I think it's an amazing tool to help us uh, support conservation and protect our natural resources. Well, we certainly have gotten good uh, feedback from our Iowa NRCS folks about that program, uh, and we certainly are aware of the importance of it. Uh, I w to, to sort of elevate that comment beyond uh, th that one, one issue, I would say, and I'm proud to say, that we have a record number of acres in, in, enrolled in conservation programs today in America, uh, and I think you're going to see more of that, and here's why. Uh, there will no doubt be limited federal resources for all of these programs because of what's going on in terms of deficit uh, reduction. But that doesn't necessarily mean that there will be less money uh, invested in conservation, and here's why. Two items. Um, one is the establishment of ecosystem markets. Uh, I think there's enormous potential in this country and potentially internationally over time for us to figure out if we can quantify and measure the exact result of a certain conservation practice. There may very well be a business or industry that needs that result to satisfy some regulatory responsibility. I'll give you an example. Uh, in Oregon, there's a power company that takes water out of a stream, uses it to produce power. They dump it back into the stream, but it's a little warmer than when they took it out. The problem with that is the salmon don't like it, so government comes along and says you've got to build a cooling tower. Well, you can define the temperature of water. You can define uh, if you have a conservation practice that will reduce the temperature of that water, somebody might be willing to pay for it, especially if it's less costly than the cooling tower. So somebody came up with a bright idea. If folks along the river and stream there planted shade trees, that you would naturally lower the temperature of the water. The salmon would like that. The landowners would be paid for that conservation practice, and the company would save about $7 million. So that's what they've done. Well, if we can replicate that in local areas across the country with specific, defined, measurable results that are verifiable, then we can create markets all over the country, and we can see private investment go into those conservation practices. The second piece is working with our sister agencies that are regulatory agencies to see whether or not we can get some degree of regulatory certainty from them so that when a landowner, farmer, rancher does in fact invest in certain conservation practices, puts his or her own resources into it, that they're assured at least for some period of time that someone's not going to come in and say, thanks very much for what you did last year, but here are a whole set of new regulations and this is what you're going to have to do in addition to what you just spent. Uh, we think that there's real opportunity in this concept. We've tried it out with the sage grouse in, in western United States, uh, with the Department of Interior and the Endangered Species Act. Uh, certain conservation practices, if you follow them, you're deemed in compliance with that act. Uh, we are engaged in conversations with Secretary Northey here in Iowa uh, and with uh, folks in Virginia and Pennsylvania in the Chesapeake Bay Area to see if we could pilot this notion. And if you could combine ecosystem markets with regulatory certainty, uh, you would, I think, see significant investment in conservation, together with appropriate technology. If there's no one at that microphone, you're next. Okay. My question follows closely on that and uh, on the last question. And here in Iowa, we often hear this idea that we need to feed the world. Um, and in fact, it drives a lot of our producers' motivation, in, as well as motivation in uh, universities like Iowa State. Um, but I also see this mandate to feed the world sometimes being used to justify unsustainable ag practices. Um, as the gentleman previously uh, mentioned, things like the Iowa Daily Erosion Project uh, suggests that we continue to lose uh, massive amounts of soil erosion. And while we do have conservation, as you just mentioned, a lot of those conservation practices end up being at the field edge. And so we're stopping the water, or stopping the soil, excuse me, from entering the water, and we may have uh, water quality benefits. But at the same time, we're still uh, having detrimental effects to our fertility within our field, uh, even in the midst of those conservation practices. And so I'm wondering how, um, what your thoughts are on, on balancing a juxtaposition between feeding the world and feeding the future. Because as uh, we conduct agriculture in Iowa nowadays, I feel that we're actually jeopardizing our ability to feed the future. Well, I think part of the answer to that question is making sure that there's diversification in agriculture and that there are options and opportunities for folks uh, to not necessarily to do it one way, but
but that there are multiple ways to do it and to learn from those multiple ways. Uh, we do an ag census every five years. Uh, we did one in uh, uh, 2007. The very first day I was secretary, I'd been sworn in, all excited, went to the office, hung my picture of Henry Wallace up there so I could remind uh, my roots. And I looked at my desk, and on my desk was this book that was like six feet tall. I mean, it was huge. Ag census, filled with lots of data. I assumed because it was on my desk that every secretary in the past had read this, so I read it. Here's what I learned from it. I learned that we actually saw a, an amazing new opportunity emerge over the last several years of relatively small operations. About 100,000 new operations, you know, very, very small, got started in the last five years. Uh, entrepreneurial, innovative, creative, uh, some of them organic, but not necessarily all, uh, looking at creative ways uh, to, to do farming on a smaller scale. Uh, I think we needed to encourage that because that's going to help in part repopulate, hopefully, rural communities across the country. So we created uh, an effort to try to make sure that we didn't just focus on one type of agriculture, that we essentially focused on all types of agriculture and encouraged all types of agriculture. Uh, so we've made a concerted effort uh, through grants, through conservation uh, uh, programs, uh, through research projects, uh, through standards, to try to provide additional support, hundreds of millions of dollars of additional support for that, for that effort. The second thing I would say is that if we're going to have diversification in agriculture, and I think we need to have it, if you go back into the 40s and 50s, and, and, and Neil Harrell probably will be able to correct me when I, when I say this, but because he knows everything about agriculture. I think we had an agriculture where the average farmer would produce anywhere from three to six items. And so they had a lot of, they had a lot of protection. If, you know, if one thing didn't work out, they had five other things that did. Well, today, in most of the, 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 the operations that we see here in this state, we're probably growing two or three crops. So our, our margin of error has been reduced significantly, which is why we have this conversation about safety nets and crop insurance and all those kinds of things. Well, if we begin to introduce more diversity in agriculture, we're going, to, we're going to have conflicts, right? We're going to have conflicts between ways and styles. So if I'm a conventional farmer and you're an organic guy and, and Christy over here is a production agriculture person working with GMOs, you know, there is that possibility that somehow, some way, what I'm doing affects you or what you're doing affects me or what Christy does affects you. And right now there really isn't much of a structure that will compensate you for economic loss that results. It's not really a good idea to sue your neighbor. It doesn't work very well. It doesn't support community. Probably not a real good idea to sue the company, the seed company, because, you know, that's long drawn out, uh, maybe not uh, particularly profitable. So we're working uh, with our AC21 committee uh, at USDA to try to figure out, is there a way in which we can create some kind of mechanism, an insurance product, a fund, some kind of way in which we would avoid that kind of uh, division in the countryside and create a more cooperative attitude. So there are a couple things that just to, to give you an indication that we are keeping an eye on this, in addition to all the conservation programs uh, that, that we have going at USDA. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to be at a school that has engineering expertise. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, my name is Ines. Now I'm the master course student at the Hokkaido University in Japan. And this is my simple question, because my, uh, food insecurity is a complicated problem that I know, but, and for that I'm USDA with 20 countries that already make some efforts to face this complicated problem. My question is, um, is it possible this world free from the food insecurity? And I'm wondering when will that time come? Thank you. Well, uh, I think you have to think it's possible. Uh, because if you accept that it's impossible, I think you accept a world that is going to be constantly in conflict. 
and constantly in upheaval and constantly uh, countries challenging each country for uh, for the capacity to feed their, their, their people. I, I, I don't think we want to acknowledge that this is an impossible task. It is a difficult task because of the complexity of agriculture. I, you know, I think a lot of people out in this country just think agriculture is about a guy going out, throwing a few seeds on the ground, waiting a couple of months, coming in and harvesting it, selling at the elevator, taking the money to the bank, and living comfortably during the winter. I, honestly, I think that's the image a lot of people have. They have no idea. It is the most, in my, my estimation, the most complicated business in the world. You not only know, have to know how to produce a crop, but you have to know how to market it. And that's very complicated, right? So it, it, and it's enormously expensive based on the, the process. Now, the, the reason why we have, in part, gone to the production agriculture that we have in the United States is if you look at real, in real terms, real income terms, it's tough to be a farmer. And I've been, I, someone told me the other day that in only 10 of 60 years, the past 60 years, have commodity prices seen real increases, real increases. Well, you know, if you're running a business and only one out of every six years you're profiting, you're going to have to be really smart to stay in business. You're going to probably have to do more with less. And that drives you towards this whole productivity thing. So I, I don't think it's easy. I don't think it's impossible. But I do think it will require not just the United States, but every developed country working in concert. And I think it's going to take some attitude changes on the part of developing countries uh, to be willing to embrace more technology. I'll give you an example. I was with a farmer uh, in a developing country, and he had a, a quarter hectare lot, uh, and he had one dairy cow. And he planted corn and beans same time, same place. His theory was that beans would come up, and somehow they would nourish the corn, and the corn would come up, and, and he'd sell the corn and the beans, and, and he'd milk the cow, and he'd be able to take care of his family. We suggested to him that if he rotated those crops, if he put them in different places and rotated them, his productivity would increase. He might be able to buy a second cow. If he buys a second cow, he might be able to sell the milk. If he sells the milk, he might be able to buy more land. If he buys more land, he might be able to have a, a more secure uh, opportunity for a Very resistant to that because this is what he had been taught. Understand that. Very, but very, very resistant to it. So we've got work to do, all of us. Good evening, Secretary Vilsack. I'm Zach Boss. I'm a junior here at Iowa State in Ag Business. My question is, global demand for protein is going to be going up here in the next 10 years. What's, your, what's the USDA's plan to feed more protein to the world, especially when protein sources like hogs here in Iowa are becoming unaffordable, like at $6, $7 to feed them? Um, that's my first question is about the protein. My second question is about the trade policy with South Korea, Colombia, and Panama, what the updates are on that. Okay. Um, well, there are a lot of sources of protein. Uh, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be livestock. And I think what you're going to see is uh, continued research in developing those, a multitude of sources and figuring out ways in which we can educate ourselves here in the United States and others to use those resources. Uh, I think secondly, it is really about continued research and productivity. Uh, you might be able to produce more livestock uh, more efficiently. You, you, you will figuring out more efficiencies in terms of feed feed and how, how you can uh, use grains more effectively. I mean, there's a whole series of, of efforts here to try to make the whole system more productive and more efficient. The more productive and more efficient it is, the more you can have of it, the more you have of it, the easier it is to meet the protein demand. And then when you, substitute, when you add to that other alternatives, and that's why you're going to see a significant increase in aquaculture. Um, you're going to see it here in the United States. You're going to see it around the world. Um, you're going to see that supplement uh, if you will, or be a partner with what we would traditionally look as our protein sources, livestock. On the trade agreements, and we are, we are, we're probably not as far advanced on the aquaculture as we need to be. Uh, we had some meetings uh, recently with, uh, with folks to try to see if there's ways in which we can step up our game in that, in that arena. We spend a lot of time, obviously, on hogs and cattle and poultry, um, and, and far less time on on aquaculture, but we're beginning to see 
the emergence of that. We're also beginning to see interesting uh, opportunities for, for uh, vertical uh, aquaculture facilities, taking um, old factories and converting them into fish producing factories. Uh, it's an interesting concept. There's an outfit in South Carolina that's trying to figure out how to do it with shrimp. Uh, and, you know, that raises a whole series of opportunities in terms of urban farming. So I think you're going to see a lot of dynamic changes in agriculture. Agriculture is constantly changing. On the trade agreements, here's what I know. They're going to pass. Uh, I think you'll see action this week. Uh, I don't know that you'll see both, house, both the House and the Senate pass them, but I think you will see uh, some positive action on the trade agreements this week. The President of South Korea is coming uh, on, um, on Thursday uh, to the United States, state dinner. Uh, we obviously want to greet him with better news, uh, good news on the trade front. This is important for agriculture. I got off the phone today talking to a, uh, an influential member of the House about you know, encouraging him to support these agreements. In Korea, it's 1.9 billion additional dollars of trade for the United States. We're going to have a record year in trade, uh, $135 billion of trade, agricultural trade. We'll have a surplus of roughly $42 billion. That's eight times what it was five years ago, uh, and there are a lot of reasons for it. Uh, one reason, I think, is that we're doing a better job at USDA being strategic about how we approach trade. Uh, you know, we, we have great cooperators. Uh, we have a great brand. We've got something that we can sell effectively. Currency issues. I mean, there's a whole series of reasons why we're seeing uh, better numbers. We're going to see a continuation of those better numbers. When you add $1.9 billion from the Korean to what we're already doing with Korea, who's our fifth leading trading partner, it will be the equivalent of the nine previous free trade agreements in terms of agriculture. Colombia and Panama, obviously less than $1.9 million, several hundred million dollars, but important because it gives us a foothold, a better foothold in those regions of the world. Uh, and Korea, the Korea Agreement gives us an opportunity to, I think, re-engage Japan and China on conversations about beef. So there's a, a real opportunities here, and I, I think you're going to see them pass. I would be very surprised if at the end of this month if, if all three of them aren't passed and, and uh, on their way. Hi, my name is Karen Fry. I'm an Iowa State graduate and a mother and very concerned about the quality of food. Um, I heard you talking about trying to get better food into the schools and um, I know that the, um, the Academy of Environmental Physicians has asked their patients not to eat GMO foods. I lived in Europe for a decade and they, a lot of the countries are requiring that anything that has GMO um, products is labeled. So I'm wondering, part one, are we going to be able to see the labeling of GMO products in the foods here in the United States? And two, are you going to be sensitive to that kind of thing when you're working with the G20? There's a lot of, uh, environment, a lot of organic and biodynamic farming going on in the rest of the world. And um, you know, I wonder how sensitive you are and how much money and resources might be put into a, a real sustainable um, type of agriculture? Well, roughly 4% of agriculture today in America is organic. Uh, and it's increasing, uh, but it's, it's increasing at a relatively uh, significant rate, but it's a small part of our agriculture. We are trying to be supportive. Um, we are tightening up the standards so organic means organic. Uh, we're providing conservation dollars, as I said earlier, to organic programs that were not provided before. Uh, we have maintained specialty crop grants that uh, the previous administration was going to eliminate, which inured to the benefit uh, in large part. Uh, we're trying to create additional markets uh, for, for folks, both in terms of expanding farmers markets, where a lot of those products are sold. Uh, we've seen a 30 percent increase in farmers markets. We're also trying to address the issue of food deserts, both in urban areas and in, and in rural areas, to make sure people have access to more fruits and vegetables, more, uh, more fresh food. Uh, so there are a lot of activities going on. On the labeling issue, that, that's going to be an interesting debate because in America, labeling has always traditionally been about nutrition in terms of calories and sodium and the, what's in the, the item, right, the, the ingredients, and uh, uh, safety issues, uh, handling issues. There's, there's no research that has been presented to us that has suggested or indicated that there's actually a, a uh, a threat to human health. Now, you There's may a lot have, of research out there. Well, uh, n not that's been persuasive in up to this point. In order for the label to take place, we would have to change our philosophy of labeling in this country. 
I don't know that that's going to happen in the in the near term. It may happen in the long term, I, and it, what may hap, what what may cause it to to change is not so much uh, the the debate between whether or not it's safe or not safe, but market forces. You know, if your customer begins to demand something, and enough customers demand it, the market ultimately responds. At this point, there's not that customer demand, but that's not to say that in the long term there couldn't be. As far as sensitivity in, in, in Europe is concerned, we have ongoing conversations about this. Um, and frankly, what we're seeing in Europe is a beginning of an appreciation for the need for this science because they are deeply concerned they're not going to be able to produce enough to be able to feed the world. So this is, a, this is an ongoing debate. I have resisted choosing because I see my job as agriculture secretary uh, in terms of uh, sort of like my two sons, I love them both. Don't ask me which one I love the most. I love them both. Um, I know a lot of people disagree. Somebody, you know, folks are on one side or the other. The problem with that is, and it's, I'm, this is a long answer to your question, but it's an important, really important question you've raised. The problem with that conversation is we forget that in America, farmers represent less than 1% of the population. And if we want to have support for farmers in this country, Farmers have got to stop fighting each other and start talking more effectively to the other 99%. Now, the other 99% may very well come back to them and say, hey, we want more information. Fair enough. And when they do, I think the market will respond. But at this point, that's not happening. Thank you. I'd uh, just like to thank you for what you just said there about uh, farmers being able to respond. I feel like as an industry, agriculture is very uh, flexible. If the market demands it, uh, it'll be produced. And, and going on with that, how do we educate that other 99%, uh, whether it's here in the United States or across the world? And especially as a, as a younger generation, uh, people my age, below 25, eventually, um, scarily enough, we're going to have to fill those shoes ahead of us. So what do we need to do um, to get and, and move along um, feeding the world? Well. I'd say a couple things, uh, and this is by no mean, means a, comp you know, a complete answer. We could have that conversation for a long time tonight. I think, first of all, uh, there has been an effort recently for commodity groups and organizations representing farmers of all stripes to come together and speak with a single voice about this enormous capacity we have in America to produce our own food and to do it in a safe way. Um, and I think, frankly, as, as they've done research on, on what the other 99% are interested in, they're finding that there needs to be a different message to those, 99, those other 99%. They're finding that it isn't enough to say, hey, we're feeding the world, we're feeding the United States. Uh, we have to be sensitive to the concerns recently expressed by the last question of whether or not what's being provided is safe, is it nutritious, is it the right thing for my family? Uh, it gets more into food safety than into the issue of GMOs, but th there's, there's a part of America that wants to have that conversation. But the vast majority of America wants to make sure that the food's safe, okay, that there aren't pathogens and things that are going to hurt their family. Uh, and every time we have a food safety issue, whether it's cantaloupe or tomatoes or spinach or whatever it might be, that raises people's awareness and concerns which is why we have made a concerted effort in the last two and a half years to really focus on food safety at USDA and to, and to take some historic steps in trying to reassure consumers that, uh, that the food is safe. Um, you know, the second thing I think is, is that there does need to be an understanding that if I want to be an organic producer, I ought to be able to do that. And if you want to be a GMO producer, you ought to be able to do that and we ought to figure out how we live in the same world together. That we're not trying to convince, I'm not trying to convince you that I'm, I'm, what I'm doing is the only way to do something, and you're not trying to convince me that what I'm doing has no value and is not significant and, and is irrelevant. It's very relevant. And the market is speaking right now, small, small segment, but a growing segment, I think over time, uh, an increased, uh, in increased segment. And farmers are beginning to react. I think the farm of the future is going to look a lot different. Uh, I think you're going to have energy crops being grown. I think you're going to have, uh, you're going to have uh, forested areas uh, being. Uh, you're going to have you know, row crops as we currently have. You're going to have livestock. You may have organic. I mean, you may have 
uh, more local markets, more regional markets than we have today. We're also trying at USDA to create better connection between uh, what's being produced. Um, the reality is that a lot of people want to know not so much they don't want to, may not may not want to know whether it's organic or not. They they would like to know who their farmer is. They like to know where it's coming from, and they'd like to know they're helping somebody local. Okay, because they do have a, a sense that it's tough, and so we're doing a better job of trying to figure out how we can connect more effectively producers and consumers. We had a conversation about this just uh, uh, before it, before it started, uh, 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 about programs that are that are taking place to make that connection more effectively. So I think. A conversation in which all everybody's at the table understanding, hey, we've got to education, we've got to listen, we've got to respond, and figuring out ways in which folks can do the kind of farming they want to do and, co and, and in a sense, coexist. Uh, question over here. We may have time for you, but that's it. Secretary Vilsack, uh, thank you very much for your leadership, for your uh, comments here today. Uh, I'm Roger Marr. I'm CEO of the One Health Commission, which is uh, now headquartered here at Iowa State University. And I'd like to uh, ask you to share maybe some of your thoughts concerning the One Health approach, the integration of uh, uh, various institutions, disciplines working together towards integrating animal health, human health, plant health and environmental health into a One Health focus. Uh, uh, some of the efforts that the USDA is uh, particularly focused on, I'm aware of the Vision 2015, for instance. Well, I think uh, uh, there's an opportunity here. Every time there's a farm bill conversation, there's an opportunity to have that type of, uh, of conversation in terms of uh, what kind of programs we're going to provide resources for. Uh, and I will tell you that resources being constrained as they are, that there better be a better integration and better coordination, that we don't have the luxury of being off here in animal health and having plant health be over here and human health over here. We don't have that luxury anymore. We, we really do have to have, if for no other reason than economics, we've got to figure out how the research being done over here impacts and affects and can, and can benefit the research here and here. So there, there will be a concerted effort within our research capacity at USDA to look at that integration. Uh, and to focus our, our resources in a, in a more concentrated way. Um, you know, it's about education. Uh, the, the conversation here today has been a good one. It's about education. You know, I've got more to learn. You've got more to learn. We all have more to learn about food, uh, about food safety, uh, about, you know, the, the, the issue of food safety is, is an, it's amazingly complicated. It's changing all the time. Just to give you an example, uh, we just ba basically decided that we were going to we were going to uh, declare as adulterants uh, non 0157 STEX, which are pathogens that that are, that are E. coli, uh, but they're not the traditional E. coli that you normally think of, but they are E. coli that are responsible for 121 125,000 illnesses in the country, uh, 33,000 of them from beef, uh, you know, and people get very seriously ill and in some cases die. Um, we didn't have the testing materials two and a half years ago to really identify those pathogens very effectively. Uh, we didn't, to a certain extent, we didn't know what risk they were. We now are beginning to see that we have got to get ahead of this. We have to get ahead of the pathogens, which is really hard. It was really hard. So uh, the capacity to integrate and coordinate our science will not only tell us how to prevent cooking, handling, and processing, but also may very well be instructive in terms of on-farm activities, right? How animals are, are, are handled, how, how animals are segregated and separated from uh, vegetables and crops that are being grown, et cetera, to be able to minimize those risks. So lots of coordination taking place. Thank you. Last question. All right. Hey, nice to see you here at Iowa State, Secretary Vilsack. Um, I know you mentioned Bangladesh a little bit earlier and uh, their inability to grow everything that they need, and they have a high percentage of malnourished people. Um, I know that they can grow rice, but they need a lot more for nutrition for the malnourished um, population. Are there specific crops that we can grow to target um, so we don't have to use as much bulk and they can be nutritionally dense enough? Um, that we can grow for the future to help these malnourished people just reach the line a little bit above you know, I, being malnourished? I, I'm sure they are, but I'm not going to be able to tell you precisely what they are. I mean, there are a whole series of, of 
crops around the world that are pretty dense and, and, and are very nutritious and we are, are working on developing them. But I will say on rice specifically, we're looking at ways in which two things. One, that rice can withstand flooding conditions. Now it seems sort of counterintuitive that you'd be worried about floods and rice, but, but actually floods can damage significantly rice crops. Is there a way in which you can basically have a crop that, that in flooding conditions becomes dormant and then when the flooding uh, conditions uh, recede, uh, springs back to life. They're working on that. Secondly, is there a way in which you can enrich that rice with the vitamins that would be necessary or needed, particularly vitamin A, uh, to be able to deal with some of the, uh, the uh, eyesight issues that are, that are a result of not having sufficient and adequate amounts of vitamin A, and that's happening. And that, again, gets back to uh, the point that I made first and foremost, this is really about innovation. This is really about figuring out how to do things in an innovative and creative way, uh, how, to, how to do more with less, how to figure out if you've got drought conditions, is there any way that you can produce a crop that can grow in drought conditions? Is there any way you can produce a crop that can grow when it's flooded? And you know what? I have enormous capacity, and I'll, I'll end with this notion. I, I have enormous confidence in the young people who are in this audience. And frankly, I think the, the answer to, to America's recent woes is in this room. The capacity of this country to once again be a country that makes, creates, and innovates. You know, that's the formula. Uh, you know, if, if we become a country that does that again, we become a country that exports, and when we become a country that exports, we create strong middle classes. But we've got to be able to produce things that matter. We've got to be able to innovate and create things that the rest of the world needs or wants, or both. And we got out of that business for a while, except in agriculture. Agriculture continues to evolve. It continues to figure out creative ways. And that's the reason why we're facing a, a very difficult economy, except in one segment of our economy, and that's in agriculture. We're going to look at potentially record income levels this year, in part because of the innovative and productive nature of American farmers and their willingness to continually embrace technology. There's a lesson there for the rest of the country and the rest of the world. Uh, we have to continue to do that. Uh, places like Iowa State need continued investment so that you can continue to come up with these ideas. You all have the solutions to these problems. You're all going to help solve those problems. Uh, but if we shortchange you, if we don't invest adequately in research, uh, we limit your capacity to do that. I also have a quick comment. Um, can all these people vote for Christy as well? Uh, <laughs> I'm staying away from that. <laughs> Please join me in thanking Secretary Vilsack.